We don't know the number. The United States is very good at compiling statistics, but there are some big holes in the statistical picture of life in America, and so we don't know what number Heather Heyer is. She is the person most recently murdered in the United States for taking a stand against white supremacy. White supremacists have been murdering people for taking a stand against them for hundreds of years. We don't know the number of slaves that they murdered. We don't know the number of free white people who were too sympathetic to slaves who they murdered. White supremacists have been trying to win through terrorism and murder throughout the history of the United States. Two years ago, the Equal Justice Initiative in Alabama released a study that counted 3,959 victims of, quote, racial terror lynchings. That was their term, racial terror lynchings. And this was just in 12 southern states and only from 1877 to 1950. There were more in other states during those years that were not counted in that study. And then there were the murders during the civil rights movement of the 1950s and the 1960s, including the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968. Heather Heyer takes her place in history now, beside the names Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney, the three civil rights workers murdered in 1964. Andrew Goodman and Michael Schwerner were New Yorkers, two Jewish kids who responded to the call to go south, where they joined with Mississippi civil rights worker James Cheney in trying to help black people register to vote. That was enough to get you murdered in Mississippi in 1964, and everyone knew that before Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney took their lives in their hands by taking a stand against white supremacy in Mississippi. Those days were supposed to be behind us. It wasn't supposed to be dangerous anymore to take a stand for racial equality in the United States, including in the South. But we were reminded on Saturday that white supremacy has never given up on terrorism and murder. And so Heather Heyer is its latest victim. Heather Heyer's mother, Susan Bro, now wants to do everything she can to make sure we never forget what her daughter stood for. I lost my child, and I'm heartbroken over that. And I would grieve in private, but she stood for something. And by golly, I'm going to advocate that let's make that a strong movement, as my child was a strong child. And if it's going to mean that I have to bear my soul in front of people, then I'm going to do that in a way that's not going to cause more anger, that's not going to cause retaliation. It's not about getting even. It's about making that same spirit of change and equality and fairness and justice move forward. We will be hearing more from Heather Heyer's mother throughout this hour. We will hear more about how she feels and how she wants us to remember her daughter. We knew before Heather Heyer was murdered that Donald Trump is not an eloquent man. We knew that his political career was launched by his racist lies about President Obama's birth, racist lies that he pushed for six years unapologetically. So by the time Donald Trump announced his candidacy for president, there was not a racist in America that didn't know that Donald Trump was their candidate. And since 1964, when a Democratic president signed the Civil Rights Act, every racist who votes in presidential elections for a major party candidate has known that the Republican candidate was a better choice for racists, beginning with Barry Goldwater in 1964, who as a senator voted against the Civil Rights Act. There are many ways to describe the white men who went to Charlottesville, Virginia this weekend to take a stand against people of color and Jews by chanting blood and soil and Jews will not replace us. But one way to describe them is Republican, Republican voters. White supremacists who voted for a major party candidate for president this time in last year's election voted for Republican Donald Trump.
We don't have exit polls on white supremacists, but we do have the ability to think. And we have David Duke praising Donald Trump on Saturday in Charlottesville. This represents a turning point for the people of this country. We are determined to take our country back. We're going to fulfill the promises of Donald Trump. That's what we believed in. That's why we voted for Donald Trump, because he said he's going to take our country back. And that's what we got to do. And so, of course, on Saturday, when the president first spoke about the latest white supremacist murder in the United States, he read a written statement that claimed there were many sides to share for the, bl the blame for what happened. We're closely following the terrible events unfolding in Charlottesville, Virginia. We condemn in the strongest possible terms this egregious display of hatred, bigotry, and violence on many sides. You see how he was reading that statement? That statement was written for him. He is the only president who has openly employed a white supremacist in the White House as his most experienced political advisor. Steve Bannon's only experience in politics was running a hate-based website. But that is more political experience than most other people working in the Trump White House. That was the Bannon message on Saturday. And the president wanted to make sure that everyone heard that there were many sides, especially white supremacists. He wanted to make sure that they heard that there were many sides. And at the point where he came to the many sides phrase written for him, he looked up from his written speech, said many sides again, ad-libbed a few more words before going back to his written script. On many sides. It's been going on for a long time in our country. Not Donald Trump not Barack Obama. This has been going on for a long, long time. It is no place in America. What is vital now is a swift restoration of law and order and the protection of innocent lives. There was, of course, immediate outrage at the president's idea that there were many sides to this murder, and many well-meaning people demanded that the president say something that sounded more presidential, that sounded like something any other president before him would have said. I, for one, was not one of them. I, I want politicians to tell us exactly what they really think, and Donald Trump did. He did that on Saturday. That's what he really thinks, that there are many sides. He didn't have to, have to add a word to that for me. I understand exactly what he meant. And I understand why he was saying it. He didn't want to criticize people who are fighting for a white America, an America without black people, people of color, or Jews, or anyone who doesn't look like them, because Donald Trump knows those people vote for him. He knows those people believe that he is fighting for what they are fighting for. But over the weekend, the pressure mounted, especially from Republican members of Congress, like 83-year-old Republican Senator Orrin Hatch, who tweeted, we should call evil by its name. My brother didn't give his life fighting Hitler for Nazis' ideas to, be, to go unchallenged here at home. And so today, the president read a statement written for him, read it word for word. He did not dare take any questions about that written statement. He just kept his eyes locked on a teleprompter, reading the words that his political advisors said he should say today. Racism is evil, and those who cause violence in its name are criminals and thugs, including the KKK, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and other hate groups that are repugnant to everything we hold dear as Americans. We are a nation founded on the truth that all of us are created equal. We are equal in the eyes of our Creator. We are equal under the law. And we are equal under our Constitution. Those who spread violence in the name of bigotry strike at the very core of America. That did not lose Donald Trump the vote of a single white supremacist. Because every white supremacist, supremacist knows that any other president would have said something like that on Saturday, would have said it right away. David Duke and his white supremacist friends get to admire 
just how long it took Donald Trump to play the game that he played today and say what mainstream Republicans and everyone else in the country wanted him to say. No other national politician would have held out that long for white supremacists, and the white supremacists know it. They watched it happen. They watched how long Donald Trump held on for them before he gave that mandatory reading of those mandatory words. White supremacists know they will never, ever have a better president for them than Donald Trump or a better candidate for president than Donald Trump. Nothing he said today changed that. Kenneth Frazier is the chairman and CEO of one of America's biggest pharmaceutical companies. He has been a member of the American Manufacturing Council in the Trump administration. And today, Kenneth Frazier issued this statement, I am resigning from the president's American Manufacturing Council. Our country's strength stems from its diversity and the contributions made by men and women of different faiths, races, sexual orientations, and political beliefs. America's leaders must honor our fundamental values by clearly rejecting expressions of hatred, bigotry, and group su supremacy, which run counter to the American ideal that all people are created equal. And Donald Trump immediately, immediately tweeted an attack on the black CEO who took a stand against Trumpism today. Now that Ken Frazier of Merck Pharma has resigned from President's Manufacturing Council, he will have more time to lower rip-off drug prices. Donald Trump did not explain to his followers why there hasn't been a single word about rip-off drug prices in any of the failed health care bills that President Trump has supported this year. Donald Trump doesn't care about drug prices. He doesn't care about how much his voters have to pay for drugs. Donald Trump cares about holding on to every voter who supports him, including white supremacists. Another CEO quit the President's Manufacturing Council tonight, but this time the President has said nothing about it, not a word. This CEO, Kevin Plank, is white. It's the only difference between Kenneth Frazier and Kevin Plank in terms of what they did today. They both resigned from the President's Commission. One is black, one is white. One was attacked by the President, one wasn't. That is not the kind of thing that goes unnoticed by the white supremacist vote. Two state police officers were killed in a helicopter accident while they were on duty in response to the white supremacist march in Charlottesville, Virginia. It was an accident. But was an, it was an accident that would not have happened if the white supremacists did not create a situation that required a state police helicopter on the scene. Donald Trump said all the right things about the state police officers who were killed, officers H.J. Cullen and Burke M. Bates. But when Heather Heyer was murdered, he blamed many sides. We don't know what number Heather Heyer is. We don't know how many thousands and thousands and thousands of people have been murdered in the United States over hundreds of years taking a stand against white supremacy, and we don't know how many more will be murdered in the United States for taking a stand against white supremacy. But we do know that Donald Trump will never, ever know how to say the right thing in that situation. We do know that no matter what Donald Trump finds himself reading in a teleprompter, he will always be white supremacist's favorite candidate for president. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.